<laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for staying with us during the delay. Uh, we've uh, processed through the technical difficulties. Uh, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Inspired Learning Author Conversation. I'm Dave Quinn, and I'm the Director of Technology Integration for the Menden Upton Regional School District. Uh, again, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time this season, we have merged the Inspired Learning Project and our MURSD Leads Author Series into this conversation. Our guest today is John Warner, the author of Why They Can't Write, Killing the Five Paragraph Essay and Other Necessities. Uh, in addition to being an author uh, and a uh, Washington Post number one bestseller at that, uh, John is also an editor, an education speaker, and a consultant. Uh, he's a contributing editor for the wickedly funny McSweeney's um, online magazine and writes for both the Chicago Tribune and Inside Higher Education on uh, books, reading, and writing pedagogy. Uh, he's also a writing instructor at the College of Charleston. John, thanks so much for joining you tonight, this afternoon, actually. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I was talking to you off the bat, I, this book has been one of the most pleasantly surprising books I've read uh, in kind of the, the history of our, our series um, because of the holistic approach you've taken to the writing process and, and how accessible it is. It's not just for writing teachers. I think it's for, for educators across the board um, and not just for, you know, the, a higher ed audience. I think anybody who teaches writing, whether you teach it with little kids, um, as, as evidenced by the, the peanut butter and jelly uh, writing uh, prompt that you will talk about a little bit later um, to, you know, the, the freshman that you're working with. Um, I just think you did a, a fantastic job. So, so thanks for, for sticking with it. I know at one point at the book, you were, you were kind of wondering, you know, is this, is this topic going anywhere? But I think uh, I really appreciate the fortitude. Thank you. Um, so John, the one question we ask every one of our guests um, is we're, we explore this idea of inspired learning or learning opportunities that have made a lasting impact. Um, and what we're wondering is, what was your most memorable or inspiring learning experience, either during your time as a K-12 student or uh, during your, your teaching career? Well, you know, I, I, I may as well start with that peanut butter and jelly experience, uh, which I write about in the book. And that happened in third grade, Mrs. Goldman's class. And um, the exercise was for us to write instructions for peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which we did. And then she brought in the ingredients for us to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And uh, she required us to try to make the sandwiches according to, strictly according to our own written directions. And, uh, of course, we had not paid attention to things like use a knife to spread the peanut butter or the jelly or amounts or anything like that. So we're sticking my fingers into the peanut butter and trying to spread it on the bread and uh, having to do it until she said that was enough because we didn't say how much. And I remember in that moment, you know, in, in third grade, um, recognizing that uh, writing is fundamentally done for an audience and a purpose that it wasn't simply something that we do for school because your teacher tells you to. Um, it has this much larger, more important function. I, now, I, I occasionally, um, in my teaching journey, I, I think I, I don't think I forgot it, but I, I for years I was um, swayed by some of what I call in the book the folklore of teaching, mm -hmm. Um, around what students should learn and how they should learn it. And a, a lot of my journey after that, particularly as an instructor, was kind of bringing myself back to that moment in Mrs. Goldman's third grade class where I connected to writing as something that lives in the world, um, a writer communicating with an audience. And um, sometimes I'm chagrined to think about how many years as an instructor it took me to get there. Uh, but that became kind of the... the the spine of my thinking around it, which ultimately led to, to examining many of the more issues that wind up in the book. So, John, transitioning into the book a bit here, um, 
the introduction was as ch- chock full of insight as as the rest of the book but what i really appreciated is you address all of like the non-issues and what's really not causing the crisis with writing so let's kind of get that out on the table what are some of the things that you often hear in those conversations that folks think are causing the issues with writing but are really not at the root of the problem yeah so this is the stuff you sort of hear out in the world of um it's all the cell phones, the texting, or the quote-unquote snowflake generation. Everybody gets a trophy and, and these sorts of things. And um, they don't learn the basics enough, like they need to diagram sentences or quote-unquote learn grammar. I hear this a lot from, from sort of people, lay people out in the world, like, oh, they need to learn grammar like I learned grammar. And, and I'll ask, like, what does that mean to you? What is learning grammar? Like, you know grammar uh, and like most of us nine times out of ten they don't remember any real grammar um mm-hmm. i can ask these same people that say a key to learning to write is learning grammar ask them what an adverb is and they'll stumble around and not know uh so i try to dispense with some of these common talking points mm-hmm. around writing um so i can get to some of the deeper things as i, I say in the book um as a, a teacher of writing, the, the thing that I was distressed by was not the, my students' skills as writers or the quality of their writing per se, it was the attitudes they held towards writing. That is what they felt writing was for, um, how they seemed to be defeated by a writing task prior to even starting it, their disconnection from writing. Um, to my mind, those are far more distressing things than whatever issues students may have making pleasing sentences as they're developing as writers. Um, that's just not um, that's not where my focus is when I want students learning how to write. So, you uh, I'm, this jumped a little bit ahead in the book, but you talk about the problem with the five paragraph essay, particularly. Um, in light of this idea of, of training wheels, right? That um, that we think it's helping, but that structure tends up being an inhibitor. Can you talk a little bit about more, a little bit about why that is, and, and what, how that uh, kind of that second order effect ends up being a hindrance to students? Sure. Yeah. The the, the notion that the five paragraph essay or template. Um, is a kind of guide or training wheels that helps students transition to something more sophisticated, I think is just not particularly true, particularly when it's um, associated with a highly prescriptive practice, even beyond five paragraphs. Um, I have, have students who will tell me that they've been given instructions like um, the number of sentences per paragraph. Uh, the number of words per sentence, um, even things like never use I, never use contractions, these sorts of things. They, be- they come laden with these, these rules without any grounding in, in what the rules may be for, or the purpose those rules are fulfilling. And they're centered around not the fundamental communicative act of writing, but of passing a writing assessment, um, a kind of simulation. And the analogy to training wheels is, um, as it turns out, uh, I'm old enough that I learned how to ride a bike with training wheels. But the the um, key skill to learn how to ride a bike is balance. And training wheels do not help you learn balance. In fact, they prevent you from having to learn how to balance because yeah. they keep you from wiping out on your bike by, by catching you. Um, so now children learn on these balance bikes where they're low to the ground and their feet are on the ground and they learn how to coast and, and how they can pedal. And for me, the analogy to writing is the, the kind of fundamental skill of writing, the thing that writers must do as they write is make choices. And those choices are dictated by uh, the rhetorical situation of message, audience, and purpose. And whenever we are removing those choices, fundamental choices from students, now I, I often put certain boundaries around the choices they're making, but they're choices ultimately that get back to message, audience, and purpose. When we remove uh, those choices, they are not practicing the thing we need them to practice, which is what am I saying, who am I saying it to, and why am I saying it to them? Like writing instructions for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, 
thing I wrote from that moment forward. And to turn them into sort of mindless five paragraph essay constructors for the purpose of passing these assessments denies them um, not only the kinds of practice that I think makes good writing, but on a deeper level, the pleasures of writing, that's one of the things that I sort of became most worried about is students really didn't connect with the parts of writing that I think are inherently pleasurable, the sort of figuring out what you have to say and finding the best way to say it and communicating with audiences. So the five paragraph essay per se is not the problem. And in fact, in the book, I, I, I call it the avatar more than the cause. It's a consequence of these other things. Um, but everybody knows it, so it kind of makes a, a handy, handy book and to these larger issues. Yeah, it, it reminded me of, of something that Gary Stagers often talked about in terms of science instruction, that we teach kids science appreciation, that they learn about science rather than doing science. And it seemed like, you know, the, the writing prompts can sometimes be uh, the an artificial writing experience versus like that authentic writing experience. Uh, I, too, learned to ride on training wheels, and I've got a, a two-year-old now at home that's got a, a, one of those Strider bikes, which, what's the key to the Strider bike is all about learning your balance, and, and uh, you know, so you're seeing that, that ramp up pretty quickly. Um, but transitioning a little bit, you frame writing um, similarly to using another analogy of that of a doctor, and you talked about writing as a practice. Um what do you mean by writing as a practice? What are some of the key components of, of writing if we think about it as a practice like medicine or um, you know, being a chef? Sure. So, so writing is not just a skill. Writing is a sort of, uh, or if it is a skill, it's something that it, it embodies different aspects. So I talk about it in, in the framework of practice. The writer's practice, I actually have a, a companion book to this book called The Writer's Practice. Which is it's, a, it's the skill, attitude, attitude, knowledge, and habits of mind of writers. So, uh, you know, to give examples of some of these, the skills are really, you know, at its most basic, the, the ability to compose sentences. That's a that's a skill. Um, the knowledge may be something like knowledge of rhetorical situation. Um, the different components of, of uh, message, audience, and purpose. It may be um, audience analysis and that sort of thing. Uh, habits of mind are more like the uh, um, the way we think about writing, um, one of which is that writing is thinking. Uh, um, it is the act of thinking sort of out loud in its way on the page habit of mind that writers need to, to um, embrace is the notion that there is no sort of terminal proficiency. You never finish getting better at writing. Writing is this um, endlessly iterative process where the experience you have um, is informed by what came in the past and then informs what you're going to do in the future. So it is this, this ongoing thing. So when I think about giving my students writing that I need them to do, I want to invoke all of those aspects of the practice, the skills, knowledge, attitudes, and habits of mind. Um, attitudes are something like um, uh, open-mindedness or empathy or um, um, audience awareness, again, works into attitudes. What, what we see in a lot of these things is that they tend to overlap. Um, I, I analogize it to like being a chef how a chef needs basic skills like chopping things with a knife or sauteing or, or the technique stuff. But at the same time, those skills don't mean much unless you also are thinking about flavor and uh, uh, those elements of cooking, which are, are more knowledge than skills. So in, in writing, these things begin to combine. Um, but a lot of the prescriptive writing instruction um, sort of, disembodies those aspects. It, it treats skills as a discrete thing, as opposed to something that's always bound up with our attitudes, our knowledge, and our habits of mind. Um, it does not invoke this idea of reflective practice, of learning from our, our experiences and moving forward with them. So I want students thinking, and, and I frame it this way at the start of my all my classes, sort of regardless of the, the writing focus, the class I'm teaching this semester is in humor writing. 
and uh, we talk about what are the practices of of humor writers in terms of the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and habits of mind. One of the habits of mind I have my students doing this semester are to look out for subject matter. What is something you could make fun of? Um, that's <laughs> yeah. what that's what humor writers uh, are concerned with, and um, they can then use that habit of mind and bring it into a class and context where they can employ the skills of making fun of stuff. Um, you can't have one without the other. You must have the habits of mind working alongside of the skills and, and and vice versa. So that's kind of the, the holistic big picture I want them thinking about when they think about writing. Well, and, and speaking of holistic, John, I think even if the students were given or develop these practices, uh, you talk about the other necessities, about the context in which all of these writing experiences sit. Um, so whether it be school culture or writing as impacted by education fads, um, I, I really appreciate <laughs> the the oversold research that comes in and, and changes all the instructional practices and then doesn't quite live up to the <laughs> replication Um process um you know standardized assessments where a lot of that's framing the work and now i think one of the most interesting and um you know fraught with 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 peril here is is the the robo grading i mean i I think we're even seeing that in massachusetts that's something that's being uh, explored um so uh, i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about which of these holistic factors and you go into into depth um i wonder if you could kind of pick the, the two that you think are really shaping the writing experiences for students that that are coming into you in higher ed and, and maybe maybe they're the ones that we might be able to have the most control over um, in our school settings so I'm gonna cheat a little and I'm gonna fold a couple into one okay. um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that the the thing that I I'm really I've been thinking about since writing the book having it be out there for just about a year now and hearing from a lot of people who've read the book and who are, who are in school, and, you know, particularly middle and high school, is this issue of atmosphere. That is the, the atmosphere under which students are learning. And um, this is something I became concerned with in seeing um, the first year college students I was primarily working with come in with um, very high incidences of anxiety and depression, um, a lot of anxiety around school, and much of it wrapped up in um, the culture of assessment and standardization of these high-stakes tests that they had, had been experiencing. Uh, so the atmosphere around learning matters, I think, just about more than anything, and, and I think that's something we can, actually, we can tangibly measure. We can ask students. Do you think you're learning? Are you, what are you learning? Um, how do you feel about what you're learning? Uh, and, and something that goes along with that that I think is um, really uh, intensified since, since I wrote the book, and it's a chapter I had on the problem of surveillance, mm-hmm. which is um, a lot of this stuff is done through well-meaning reasons, Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it is a, particularly with writing, it is a significant mistake to believe that um, things like real-time feedback are a benefit to writing. Writing benefits not from real-time feedback, but from reflection. Um, You know, I, I, um, I write a column for the Chicago Tribune every week, and I turn it in on Tuesday, today, and the last thing I did before I went to sleep last night was start thinking about it and let it sit, and then I woke up this morning, and it was there ready for me to go. If somebody had given me feedback on that idea before I went to bed, I never would have gone to sleep. I would have mm-hmm. not had that opportunity. Um, the robo grading where, uh, in theory, students are supposed to get this like feedback loop on their writing, this is not a benefit. Um, this does not allow them to contemplate the work they're doing. And even worse are, are the kind of outright surveillance, um, things like snooping on students email to see if they're swearing or considering harming themselves or others. I just think it creates an atmosphere that is fundamentally incompatible with the kinds of expression that writing requires. And and more than anything, it's creating little stress and anxiety machines. Um, 
with these things. So I tend to be a little radical on this stuff. I would I would get rid of all the, the student portals. I would not. I would go back to um, report cards and phone calls and emails home when there's something going on. I would. I believe in students practicing agency. Um, and learning from their mistakes within reason. We want to keep them from falling off a cliff, but if they fall and skin their knee, so to speak, academically, that's a learning experience. Um, I I am really distressed, um, but in- increasingly um, hopeful, particularly having talked to in forums like this and people like you, that there is a lot of energy around getting rid of those things that are creating this negative atmosphere around learning. I don't think standard, standardized tests have that much to do with learning. Um, they're simply a, a kind of, um, uh, I don't know where these, I know where they come from, but I, I don't know what they're doing for us. I don't know what they're showing that's meaningful uh, in terms of students and their lives. Yeah, I, John, I think there's there's a, a lot in that re- response. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of, of Jesse Stomel's work about you know the turn it in mentality right like you're the mm-hmm. assumption that you're plagiarizing and then a company then takes your words and what do they do with those <laughs> words right like who, who benefits right. and who and who owns the work um and you know uh, the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about too here and i don't know what the what the solution is um and you talk about folklore but i'm going to kind of twist folklore a little bit here but um, the folklore of the college admissions process, because I even think with standardized testing, the, the, the bigger picture is students wanting access to these higher education learning opportunities. And I don't know what the answer is because they're, you know, and you talk about with the grades and getting the A, I mean, the, the, the offer that you, you make at the beginning of the semester, you know, if I could just get an A, you know, for, for this, uh, mm-hmm. these deals, um, I, I think it, it, almost creates this tournament system where students feel if I don't get an A, I'm not going to get into the college of my choice or I'm not going to get into A college. Is that folklore? How much of that? I mean, this is beyond the scope of the book, but as a college writing instructor, uh, and, and do you see any hope on the horizon of how we can kind of bridge that gap between the, yeah. the high schools and the colleges? Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's a huge question, and I think it's a big problem. And um, one of the things I, I have stopped doing is trying to talk students out of their anxiety around these things, yep. because I think, they, I think they've earned it. <laughs> right. I, I wonder, say, um, oh, your grades don't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I got B's and C's in college, and I'm fine. It's a different world. Um, I graduated from college in 1992. Uh, I I can't say that my experience translates to today. Um, what I do try to do is put it put the experiences in a larger context. Um, that uh, we have a lot of research on um, in terms of your outcomes after college rather than what you study, the experiences you had make have a much larger impact on your happiness and your work and, and your life. So I, I try to share that with them. I try to focus my courses on learning. Um, in terms of sort of high school, that high school college bridge, like high school like we, we high school is to get you ready for college and we're doing this so you're you're prepared for college. One of my messages in the book is that um, training students to produce five paragraph essays or do well on these standardized assessments is not good preparation for college. I, I blame colleges as much or more for that than I do high schools. Um, cause I don't think we have done a particularly good job of communicating that, it, that which makes students quote unquote college ready. And we've allowed that those other metrics to substitute for, for what we should be valuing. Um, I do think big picture, um, man, it's a hard question. So yeah, here's, yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> I think that, I think there's there's two parts of the equation. One part of the equation to get rid of the anxiety is to considerably lessen the the literal cost of college, that is, the expense of college, to lower the perceived stakes around this decision. Um, that has changed radically in the in 
not only since I went to college, but even in the 20 or so years I've taught college. Um, students come under such pressure to perform because of either the money they're putting out in the moment or the loans they're taking on and what they perceive as the impact of the future. If we could do something like make college free, that would ratchet down some of these problems instantly. Um, at the same time, I think there's some um, work for us to do. And I think there's a big picture culture, but I also think it can be done at the individual school level to um, stop privileging things like prestige in choosing colleges. Um, there are thousands and thousands of good institutions of higher education in this country, including our community colleges. Uh, you will learn much there. You will be able to get a degree and be employed, even if you don't go to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or even, you know, sort of uh, other competitive colleges. Um, every year, uh, I believe this is true this year, but every year there are colleges with open slots that go unfulfilled. Hmm. Um, they are looking for students. So in aggregate, there is more than enough college to go around. Um, we have created this culture around prestige where it's like, if you're not going to your first choice, if you're not going to the, uh, you know, like the, um, where I grew up in the Midwest, it's like you were either the, there was the East coast top tier Ivies and Duke and those sorts of places. And then if you couldn't do that, well, you at least got to get into the big flagship state university after that whoa forget you <laughs> the fact is if you go to southern illinois university or illinois state or eastern illinois you're going to get a great education and you're going to have uh, faculty who may be far more engaged with you as a student and person than you would at a more prestigious institution so i think a lot of that is it's on us culturally i think it's on us as instructors teachers to dial back that as you said that competition that like hunger games yeah. uh, aspect to education and um uh let people know that they will succeed can succeed even if they opt out of that but if we make that promise we have to make sure that's true mm -hmm. we we can't apply endlessly compete so it's, it's sort of like you don't want students to unilaterally disarm mm -hmm. um yep. and put themselves at a disadvantage but um if, if we can at least help them see the bigger picture as they're in that arena, I think that will help. And over time, we can, we can ratchet down the temperature and get them away from just thinking the A, the degree, the credential in the book, uh, um, the college sophomore Clemson, who openly longed for the time she could retire so she could start living her life yep. as she wished. And this is somebody who's, who's 19, 20 years old and was looking 40 years in the future when she could finally live her, her life. And, you know, that stuck with me. And that was, that was probably close to 15 years ago now. And it's only gotten worse. Uh, and I, I, I hope we can, I hope we can address these things because if, if we don't, it's only going to continue to get worse. Yeah, I mean, Jen, I feel like we could spend an hour just on, on this topic. There are so many different avenues I'd love to follow up on, but I think t transitioning because into the, the next section of the book, which is about the, the new framework, um, I love the, the five goals that you, you put out in terms of, you know, increase educational challenge while simultaneously decreasing that stressing anxiety that we, talk about, uh, we talked about. Uh, change the orientation of school for preparing for like the indefinite future to like more of a mindset of creating the future. I think just those those are fantastic. I uh, encourage anybody to read the book. Just those goals are, are great framing. Um, getting to a little bit more practical piece, um, I was wondering, you, you talk about the what is a rigorous learning, uh, rigorous writing experience for students. And can you talk a little bit about what uh, rigor is in writing, what a writing experience is, and then, you know, I know this is kind of a big question, but also, could, if you could frame it around, I love the idea of your problem, audience, purpose, and process approach. Um, how, how do those all kind of work together? Uh, I'm, I'm curious about how you came up with that that four-part framework, because I think uh, as, as somebody who's reading it through the eyes of a student, I was like, oh, wow, this is really um, clear, concise, but also gives me that, that flexibility. So rigor, writing yeah. experience, that framework. 
Yeah, so so rigor, I think one of the mistakes, and, and I made this mistake myself as an instructor, is um, I associated rigor with things like number of pages um, or strictness of grading. That is how exacting I was in grading it. And really, uh, rigor is, is more of a... Um, for me, it, it's better seen as a measure of, of sort of depth and intensity of engagement. That is, how deep can you go into this problem? How um, absorbed can you be by it? Um, that is rigor to me in writing. So something like writing a book is the height of rigor, um, where I talk about that I to the point where I wanted to give up a couple of times, as you noted. Um, but the... the um, extreme challenge of that is the greatest reward. That is, I have tackled a problem that I didn't know I was capable of doing. I had not written a book like this before. I'd written other books, but nothing, never one like this. Um, and solving that problem becomes its own reward, right? So the, the, the increased rigor comes coupled with the increased reward, which is not the case when we're talking about number of pages or strictness of grading or, or that sort of stuff. Uh, the um, framing writing around problems really came out of just examining my own life as a writer, where uh, I realized any time I, I would have some new type of writing that I hadn't done before, I had to solve the problem of, of knowing how to write it. And uh, the, one of the examples I talk in the book is blogging. I write this blog for Inside Higher Ed, which I started doing in I guess in 2012, it's been quite a while now. And at the time I started it, I didn't know how to write a blog. I, I didn't know what a blog was. And uh, it would take me about a week to write a single blog post, and I would sweat over it, and be like, oh, what am I going to write about? How do I, uh, um, I've now been doing it seven years. Uh, I, I'm, I'm on the road for, for work this week, so I, I had a two-hour flight from my home in Charleston to Chicago this morning. And I wrote um, a draft of a blog post in the 35 minutes between the uh, initial notification for landing and when I had to put my laptop away. So uh, through this kind of practice, right, uh, highly proficient writing blogs for, for this space. Um, my goal is to help students develop this larger framework where through writing anything, they can then take what they've learned from writing that one thing and apply it to something else. Um, the, the work I'm in, I'm, I'm at the company I work for, Willow Research, we do marketing research. And I, I learned this when I, I first started doing this. Uh, I did it after grad school, took 20 years off, and now I'm doing it again. Um, and uh, I, I had a graduate degree in creative writing and I had to start doing things like writing focus group reports or questionnaires. And I would just go look at a questionnaire and think, how does it, what is it doing? How does it do it? How is it organized? Breaking it down. And this is what I ask students to do in, in my writing experiences. Um, I give them a problem. Uh, it's, it's usually framed by a question. Um, uh, for example, one of, the, one of the problems I have, and these are all in... I feel like I should plug my other book over here. These are in my other book, The Writer's Practice, Building Confidence Absolutely in Nonfiction should. Writing. Uh, one of the questions on the early on is, uh, should I? And that is a review. The audience, should I use this restaurant? Should I buy this app? And um, rather than giving students the templates for a review, which is what I had done for years, I instead gave them a question. Should I do something. And they would have to go uh, uncover the genre, go get examples of reviews, look at the sorts of moves writers do in reviews of different products, and then uh, create their own sort of template and their own outline and their own approach, and then uh, answer the question for the benefit of the audience. And um, I can't, I, I will not lie. I will not say that the reviews students write under that process are any better than they wrote when I had a highly prescriptive process because writing is hard. Mm -hmm. um, it is a struggle to get better and often students need practice. We all do. 
what I, I was framing it as a problem is they could then move on to the next problem with greater appreciation for how what they've done on the first problem applies to the next problem because they're analyzing audience, they're analyzing genre, they're analyzing occasion. And each experience helps them build that overall practice, helps them get better at the, at the next thing. And in the meantime, you're also seeing the quality of their sentences improve because their thinking is improving, because they know who they're writing to, because they have a sense of their own agency and power and they have something to say. So by the end of the semester, while the, the finished artifacts, right, the assignments they turn in still have issues. If you're, if you're inclined to get out your red pen and mark it up, you could. But if you then give that student a unfamiliar writing problem with a question and an audience and a purpose, they could, can and do, because I do this with my students, describe what they would do to go about solving that problem. That student is on their way to improving as a writer mm -hmm. every single time they set out to write. And that's my goal. I cannot inoculate them for their other college courses. I can't train them to do a history essay and a political science essay and a lab report. It's just not in my capacity as a first year writing instructor. I can help them learn how to think and act and um, uh, behave as writers uh, in the context of these different assignments. It's one of the reasons why the writer's practice it has uh, 40, 45, 50, 50 different, ex I call them experiences instead of assignments, of a tremendous range because I, I want them seeing how those things connect, how I learned in my, my life that a focus group report and a uh, poetry explication of a sonnet are actually related um, as writing problems that we can, we can learn to solve. So, John, uh, we're, we're right at the bumping up against the end of our time, and thank you so much for, for – uh, being so generous with yours. Um, we often discuss in our district this idea of from, and this is a Tom DeCord thing who uh, works for a group called The Tech Teacher, but from someday to Monday, right? So we, we have this, you're, we've realized, we're working towards those goals that you outlined um, in the book. But what's something that the teachers could do, you know, either tomorrow or next week? to move us closer to that vision of writing as, as a challenging but a rewarding experience for students? Some of the low-hanging fruit. So the one thing, like one quick thing, one thing that's not part of a larger pedagogical reframing or thing is um, one experience, and I like thinking about writing's experiences, that um, asks students a question that they are equipped to answer and expert in. Um, uh, and this can be something like, from the writer's practice, one of the things I do after the, the peanut butter and jelly is I ask them to write instructions for um, something they know how to do. And um, one of the greatest things I think you can provide a writer in, in particularly in the early stages of development is a kind of belief in their own expertise and that they have something to say. And it can be something straightforward, like that they know how to um, clean a saxophone they're in the band or something, and they, it, and they can describe that, yep. right? Yep. Or it could be something, something more um, uh, less concrete and more philosophical uh, where they can write about that, but something that, that encourages them to... to um, see themselves as independent thinking entities who are not just there to prove to a teacher that they learned something, mm -hmm. that they have these internal lives and they have these worthwhile things that they can express. If you can find one question that allows them to do that, even a, even a straightforward one, like what's something you know how to do that you can tell somebody else how to do, that I think is a huge moment of empowerment for for students, and it's a good bridge to those other types of writing where maybe those those aspects of themselves or, the, or their um, their own sense of the world is not as apparent. Yeah, I th it reminds me of a. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here for Douglas Rushkoff, where he's reframing. Um, you know, the new approach to gaming is not necessarily to beat the game, but to keep the game going. And I think the mm -hmm. same could be said for writing, right? The, the goal is not to have them necessarily finish the assignment, but want to keep 
the writing yeah. going um, and developing that attitude. So, John, uh, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, the book is Why They Can't Write. Uh, pick it up. It's a great, you know, we're coming up on the holiday season. It's a great stocking stuffer. Um, for those watching on the districts, if you're looking for a book study book that gets super practical, um, this is it. And then the other book, John, was The, the Writer's Practice. Is that... Uh, the, the writer's practice building confidence in your nonfiction writing. Um, it's a penguin. Uh, I'll throw it on Twitter. There's a, there's particularly for instructors. There's a, there's a link where you can get a, um, just an instructor's copy for like three bucks. Um, and I'm pitching the book, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it's got, it's got a bunch of stuff in it. I would say it, it's good from anywhere from like seventh, eighth grade, depending on the seventh and eighth graders mm-hmm. all the way to first year, um, college, textbook um it's got so much so many different things in there um and i'll be to use at any different time so um i'll throw that i'll throw a link on twitter and you can you can retweet it and get it out there and, and um any instructor should be able to get a copy for very little or nothing Absolutely. And I, I think it was, what was it, Professor Paul Thomas sent out a tweet where a student said, I wish I had had that book like 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, th- thanks. Thanks for your for, uh, your fortitude getting through these books because they're they're certainly making an impact, John. Um, I really appreciate your time. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So we are back in December. We'll have Elliot Washer, founder of Big Picture Learning and the Met. Uh, we'll be discussing his book, Leaving to Learn, which focuses on the uh, 10 expectations that students have for their teachers, but also how do we create learning experiences that span uh, beyond the traditional classroom. Uh, so for the Menden Upton Regional School District and the Inspired Learning Project, I'm Dave Quinn. Good night and thanks for watching. Take care.